Hello. This will be our sixth installment and final one for evangelism training. Again, I apologize for the slow connection. I'm hoping the main thing is that you are able to understand the urgency of the Great Commission of the Gospel of Jesus Christ to go into all the world. 700,000 people will die today. 30,000 will die every hour. 500 people die every minute. Since 33% of them are Christian, that means 462,000 people today. About half a million people will die today without Christ. That means 20,000 in an hour. 300 people every minute, probably actually 380 people every minute die without Christ. Some final thoughts when you go to evangelize either in person, in the mall, the store, or door to door. Dress casually. I would say make sure and brush your teeth. Turn off your cell phones, be polite, and smile. The first two words, you cannot spell gospel without the word go. You cannot spell God without go. You will be finding spiritual attacks the evening before and the morning of or the day of when you go. Sometimes when I do go, I present the way of the master in the mall or in the street or door to door. Other times I might use FIRM, which is the acronym for family, their interests and ideas, any religious backgrounds or thoughts, and then the message. I might even use a method I used a coworker one time who ask him what, who does he think Jesus Christ is. In other words, I try to use the Holy Spirit to guide my thinking. I do not stick with one particular message, one particular method each and every time because I don't want to limit the Holy Spirit. One man I spoke with using the Old Testament laws uh, that he said that the Ten Commandments, when I used the way of the Master, said that they're done away. I answered that the Mosaic laws, and the rituals, and the sacrifices were done away. Those were written down by Moses. They're called the Mosaic Law. And they were nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments have never been nailed to the cross. They were written by the finger of God in stone, indicating their permanency and coming from the very finger of God. They were not nailed to the cross. That just thought came to me, not sure where. I believe it was the Holy Spirit told me to tell them of the permanency because I did not prepare ahead of time what I was going to say when he said the thought the laws were all done away with. So don't try to stick with one particular method all the time. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and give you the words to say and then the time to say it. Here is where two are better than one because one can pray while the other speaks. Prayer is essential the day before, the week before, the, the morning or the, during the time and then afterwards. We cannot Hope to have any results without the Holy Spirit's guidance and God the Father drawing them before we can point them to Jesus Christ. Jesus told you to be innocent as doves. In Matthew 10, 16, it indicates that if we are living in sin and in willful disobedience to God, you will not be an effective witness. You're opening yourself up to spiritual attacks when we don't keep short accounts of our sins 
and daily confess them to God, we are opening ourselves up to spiritual attacks from the evil one. We're entering enemy territory and remember Satan is the god of this world. He's deceived the whole world and the people we're witnessing to are the children of the devil. That's what Jesus himself said. Before you go you'll have all kinds of thoughts in your mind like who do you think you are? You can't convince anyone about Jesus Christ. You are nothing. You're a sinner. You're wasting your time. Especially when you don't see immediate results. But a farmer plants a seed and it takes a long time for something to show. Someone else may come along and fertilize it. Others water it. But God gives the increase. It's not our responsibility. Believe me, I've had a lot of spiritual attacks the night before, and the morning of, and even during the time that I'm witnessing. Matthew 10:32 to 33 says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Have you ever seen the movie Perfect Storm? In the Perfect Storm it shows at the end in the hurricane the ship's going down. The captain looks up at Bobby as he goes to the surface expecting the captain to follow him. They both knew they were going to die. The captain goes down into the dark abyss with the ship and Bobby goes to the surface knowing that he's going to die. This movie at the end always makes me think about people being separated from God forever in eternal torment and darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, suffering and torment and regret for all eternity separated from God with no second chance. Perhaps the gnashing of teeth is because they have rejected the gospel that they may have heard at times and that was their only hope of escaping hell and now it's gone. I cannot imagine living with eternal regret with no second chance for all eternity and never having the chance of seeing God again. My own heart aches for people like my friends and family, my neighbors, those who will die without co-work, without Christ, like co-workers. What can I do? I can share the gospel as much as I can, as often as I can, with as many as I can. I must do this with all abandonment and recklessness and in sheer oblivion to my own personal feelings of rejection. Should I care if I'm laughed at or rejected? They're rejecting Jesus and the message, not me. They're not angry at the messenger, but at the message. The truth will set you free, or it'll make you really mad. I am willing, and I hope you are, to take the risk of someone getting mad because it's worth every risk, because people only have one of two places to spend eternity. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil things about you. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now if you've never been persecuted or ridiculed for your faith, it makes you wonder if you have been living out your faith like an undercover believer. Many churches have what I call pew potatoes. They grow eyes, but potato with eyes is only good to be buried 
and the eye is poisonous. My point is we need to get out of the pews and into the streets. I believe it's a good sign when you're persecuted or made fun of for the name of Christ. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He said, everyone. Peter knows a thing or two about persecution. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 16. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, and including 16. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. I love that, for the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. What an awesome privilege to suffer shame for the sake of Christ. You bear his name in your shame. So the power, though, is in the message. It's not in the messenger. The one who catches is Christ. Christ told Peter and the other fishermen to cast the nets. It was only at his direction did they have any catch. There are preciously few laborers, even though the harvest is exceedingly great. Time may be running out. Christ could return soon. I pray you will join me in this great labor of love to the lost and to go make disciples. Let's speak briefly about Jesus' historicity. Uh, he's the person that has been written about the most in the entire human history by the most historians in history. Jesus Christ did exist is a fact of history. Thallus is perhaps one of the earliest secular writers to record Jesus in name and around AD 221 he confirms that Jesus did live and was crucified. Josephus, the Jewish historian born of a priestly and royal ancestry, he survived the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 at age 13, he'd already been a consultant with the Jewish rabbis. Being under Jewish rule, Roman Emperor Vespian allowed to write, he was allowed to write and given freedom. Being a devout Jew and Roman citizen, Josephus could hardly be described as a friendly witness to Jesus Christ because Josephus was more of a devout Jew. He writes, that the Pharisees and the Essenes, he writes about the Herodian Temple, about uh, John the Baptist, James the brother of Jesus. All these names found in the New Testament were actual historical facts. He even describes the death of John the Baptist, mentions the execution of James, the brother of Jesus. And Josephus' final passage, he writes about Jesus interestingly. There was a time this Jesus, a wise man, Josephus writes in the Antiquities of the Jews, that it be, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received truth with pleasure. He drew many over both of the Jews and the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us condemned him to the cross those that loved him at first did not forsake him for he appeared again to them the third day as the divine prophets had foretold 
10,000 other things too wonderful for him to describe that I cannot write. And the tribe of Christians, so named for him, are not extinct to this day. The great lineage of Jesus Christ is recorded in Luke. Uh, it's also in Matthew. In any court of law, witnesses, especially eyewitnesses, are invaluable. In the whole of Judea and Samaria, there were several hundred eyewitnesses who saw Jesus before and after his resurrection. The knowledge of Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection was so important that the early church, within three to eight years after his death, wrote a creed. One of the world's most famous experts in lines of evidence for courts was Simon Greenleaf. He was an American attorney and jurist and expert in the law. In Simon Greenleaf's book, Testimony of the Evangelist, he views the multiple eyewitness accounts of Jesus and his death and resurrection as valid lines of evidence that would be admissible in a court of law. They meet or exceed any evidential requirements in a court of law. In the legal process, there are no statute of limitations on murder. The world's most famous ex-atheist, Anthony Flew, a leading British philosopher who, after 50 years of atheism, came to the conclusion that God must exist, saying, the evidence for the resurrection alone is better than for the claimed miracles of all other religions combined. You might also have others ask you about evolution. Uh, they ask me what I think about it. Did I believe that evolution was true? What was all the evidence for evolution? What about that? How can I not believe in evolution with all the facts that science has proven? Why do you believe in creation when there's hard evidence for evolution? I always answer in kind, loving, respectful, but intelligent ways that Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is within you with gentleness and respect. That's in 1 Peter 3.15. Jesus apparently did not believe in evolution. He answered the Pharisees about divorce, quoting Genesis 5, 2. He created them male and female, blessed them, and when they were created them, when they, they called them man, mankind. Jesus believed in creation. He did not say they evolved or that God created the amoebas after the amoeba kind and then they evolved into human species. In the Gospel of John actually starts before Genesis. John chapter 1 verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus is the Word. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was made that nothing was made. Again, without him nothing was made that was made. You have scientific theories. Evolution is a theory. After 150 years, it remains a theory. It is not a scientific law like Newton's three laws. Newton's three laws of motion have been established, validated, and confirmed to be true. Evolution cannot be. Evolution cannot pass the scientific method. That is, that it must be repeatable, measurable, quantifiable, and falsifiable. Since it cannot pass the scientific method, that is, it cannot be repeated, it cannot be measured, and so on, 
it will always remain a theory. Now the Bible's veracity is incredible. The Dead Sea Scrolls alone, we continue to find more of them. Jesus quoted the Old Testament as did Paul. For me, this validates the veracity of the Old Testament. Today, almost 6,000 manuscripts, 6,000 manuscripts, fragments and pieces have been discovered. Every few years they find more. The massive amount of scriptures and manuscripts found is exceedingly more substantial than any other human document ever written by mankind. There is nothing even close to it in all of human history. 66 books by 40 authors all agreeing doctrinally on the same thing. They all point to Jesus. Many of these authors never knew each other, yet they all spoke about a coming Messiah. Even archaeology is showing evidence for the historicity of the Bible. Digs have uncovered evidence of the ancient Hittites empire, once said to be mythological. King David's reign has been found recorded on ancient Egyptian writings. A stone tablet bearing Pontius Pilate's name discovered. There's been skepticism about Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. Belshazzar is mentioned by name in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 5. According to historians in archaeology, archaeology digs, Nabonius is Belshazzar's son. Tablets were excavated, clearly revealing that Belshazzar was Nabonius' son, who served as co-regent in Babylon. This explains why Belshazzar had the authority to make Daniel the third highest ruler in the kingdom and later the highest position available in the kingdom, as stated in Daniel 5.16. These tablets serve to act as an eyewitness to these facts. The discovery of the Elba archive was found in northern Syria in the 70s. The Elba clearly reveals the biblical writings concerning the patriarchs, thus establishing them as a fact. Furthermore, there are documents that have been unearthed that have written references found on clay tablets dating from around 2300 BC. They give personal names and places of the patriarchal accounts of Genesis. Even the name of Canaan was found once thought to be mythological. Even non-believers have heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. Today we know these cities actually existed and were discovered to reside just southeast of the Dead Sea. Today they're known as the modern day names of Bad Eldera and Numeria. The depth of destruction goes down three feet at these sites and they are clear sign that it was destroyed by fire. Archaeologists from Israel also uncovered an ancient quarry where they believe King Herod excavated stones for the construction of the Jewish temple over 2,000 years ago. David was one of the most prolific writers of the Old Testament. In 1994, references to the House of David were found in both Hebrew and Aramaic. The Aramaic writings could well indicate that they may have been used during the time of Christ. Since Christ and the Jews at that time had lost their Hebrew language and spoke mostly Arabic. The inscriptions mention part of the royal lineage of Israel. This is the earliest archaeological mention of King David found. The oldest known manuscripts to date are from the 7th century BC. These were found in 1979 while excavating a burial site just southwest of Jerusalem. Archaeologists uncovered three pieces of silver which turned out to be miniature scrolls. Even though it took three years to unroll them and read them, they contain numbers 6 
directly from the Bible, and it's by far the oldest reference to God that has ever been found by any archaeological team. Over 45,000 digs, 25,000 locations, each of these growing every day and all supporting the evidence of the Bible's historical record. Before I close here, I want to mention a little bit about the fossil record because fossils are like looking back at history. It's like a history book in the earth. There are 300 million fossils, 200 million species known to exist, yet not even one single set of a transitional fossil set from one species into another has ever been found. Evolutionists themselves have pointed out the problem with the theory from the Cambrian explosion they call it. The Cambrian explosion is called that because that's where almost all major forms of life appear suddenly without predecessors. This is a conundrum for the absence of ancestors. Each phyla or life form represents a blueprint or a unique body plan. Evolutionists show that in these rock layers they cannot find any new body plans that appear afterwards and no ancestors before. The Cambrian explosion is an explosion of life that looks very much like the creation account. Why have there not been any new body plans that continue to crawl out of the evolutionary cauldron in the archaeology record? Perhaps no new body plans means that there have been no evolutionary plans. They have not changed. You look for a missing link, it makes no sense to try to look for a missing link when the entire chain is missing. What we do find are animals with no ancestors and the animals, the living creatures that are past the Cambrian are unchanged. We see animals with backbones, without backbones. We don't find any ancestors of the Cambrian animals. That's perhaps because they do not exist. In closing, let me say that if there's any one that has a question about this, there are many Christian websites that have apologetics. I wrote a small book called Blind Chance and Intelligent Design. The last book I wrote was The Great Omission, Evangelizing the Lost for the Great Commission. At the end of this new book that I've just completed, are apologetics in the end of the book using hard scientific facts that are measurable, quantifiable, and they are absolutely valid lines of testimony that dispute the evolutionary theory absolutely positively. Let me say one more time that while you go out, make sure that you pray and that you keep in mind that you're going to bring as many men, women, and children to heaven as possible. I'm so glad that you're taking on the great commandment for the great commission for the way of the master, the imperative command to go into all the world. God bless you and I ask you to go with all abandonment and recklessness and keep in mind that the power is in the message, not in the messenger. And if they reject you, they are rejecting Christ. And the glory of God rests upon you when you are shamed for the name of Jesus Christ. I thank God there are churches and men, women and groups that are still willing to go into all the world as Jesus Christ commanded five times in the New Testament. And I pray God's blessing upon you all. In Jesus Christ's holy name, I pray. Amen.